So what's all this about that? Cool. It's me, Kyle. This is Give Pause Hobby, the channel where I stop to appreciate the things I love to fill my free time with. Um, we're back for the second episode of So What's All This About? Boom! Marvel United. This is big cute. Um, and just like with Imperial, last time we split this series into two videos for a game. The first one is all about the stuff. Second one, this one here, is all about the ideas. So uh, at the top of the last episode, I talked about uh, how I came to find myself as a proud owner of this game, um, the, uh, and exactly which boxes I had contained inside these two boxes. Again, it's one core box and the original stretch goal box is where I have everything Marvel United um, that I own. Now, uh, I forgot to mention last time, there is currently a Marvel, uh, what is it called? Multiverse, I think. I think that's what the Marvel United, like the newest one on Kickstarter is going on. I have zero interest in it. I love the game. Um, I wouldn't be making these videos about it if I didn't. Um, but again, this is pretty dense filled with, uh, there are many heroes I, I or n nobody I've played with has used yet. There are some villains that we haven't used yet. There are a bunch of game modes, which we'll kind of talk about today, that we haven't used yet either. Um, and to be honest, I not only, I've talked about how I've never really super collected the comic books, I am not currently really keeping up that well with all the Marvel stuff being made. Um, there was a time when, you know, they were going through the, I can't remember what they're called, the first like echelon of Marvel movies. Um, and I was watching every single one that came out, you know, when the new Hulk and Thor and Iron Man and all those were coming out, of course I was watch watching them because they were fantastic. Um, and they were interconnected in cool ways and really well done. And I, by and large, most of the videos that have come out of the MCU, um, I've really enjoyed. I think lots of people who would say they like some of them would say the same thing. It's not 100%. <laughs> They're not batting a thousand, but pretty close. Um, that said, in recent years, I've kind of not really been able to keep up that much. Uh, with all the shows coming out now, I'm trying to, to follow as best I can, but I just... With the, the schedule and the life that I've got, it's just not possible. So I found when I kind of just scrolled through the Kickstarter before the whole no buy 2023 thing started, um, I was like, you know, there's just really not anything in here that's calling to me. There, there are some cool things, totally. Um, but is it something that I think I need? I don't believe so. Um, so I have just elected to sit out um, and and I've already got enough so um, now we talked about which expansions I had uh, last time and you know the whole trials and tribulations of the original Kickstarter and today is gonna be kind of like the things that I really wanted to see more of and I I, I had to like delve into the rule books or really take their word um, when they would kind of write up a little blurb about something as opposed to seeing uh, videos of it in play or people whose opinions I trusted telling me it. Um, again, it all worked out in the end, but uh, I had no problem recognizing that the game was gorgeous, that the minis were awesome, um, that it just looked a lot like a lot of fun. That was no, you know, there was no danger in that. That was evident. However, the things that I'm talking about today the cool ideas that make this game this box of toys the rules that make this box of toys a great board game that that was the part that I was struggling with really you know seeing and when I could see it trusting that it was really going to be there when it arrived um, so here I am hindsight 2020 living in the the present I own the game and really like it and I can tell you why uh, based on these ideas, these rules that govern these really beautiful pieces. Oh, and I almost just dropped it on the floor. So before I do that, let's get over to the table and I'll show you the cool ideas that live inside Marvel United. 
All right, so the first cool idea, um, I'm opening up the smaller, but the heavier, the, <laughs> the denser um, of the two boxes, because this is the one with all the cards, um, is what I'm referring to as asymmetry light. Now, if you haven't seen one of these like decks of cards for, uh, for Marvel United, you're gonna notice a couple things. First of all, the adorable, like awesome art. Um, and then on most of the cards, it's just gonna be a big old picture and then two or one symbol at the bottom that tells you either moving, the heroic, punching, or every so often you have wild. So it's the, the color of the other three symbols. So it could be whatever you want it to be. There's also two cards, or maybe there's three, I think two, um, in each deck that not only has a symbol at the bottom, but some sort of extra rule up here. Um, so this is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and there's a twelfth that I have down here for those who watched the video last time. This is my collection of all the different heroes in the game. I don't know why I'm like not taking them out just to show this off because again, this is such an awesome selling point for you know what I've purchased so far. The the base set has like what eight heroes or something. So this is a collection of the expansions that I have. But um, I mean, talk about a selling point for the game. That's the stack of heroes you can choose from. Um, and this is one of the cards that I remove from each deck because this is a wild card, which you can move to uh, shift a game from normal mode or like I think easy to normal mode or something like that. Um, but anyways, so each deck has these symbols um, in their 12 different cards. And within those cards, I pulled out a couple of these, this asymmetry light. So you may look at someone like Cyclops and say, oh, he's pretty heroic. Look at that, six of his, in, within his deck, he has six of the heroic symbols, which let you kind of uh, solve crises and save civilians. Five attacks, five punches, which let you uh, either, you know, take out a thug or do damage to the uh, supervillain. And then three moves, which do what you would expect them to do. And then most of them have this, three wild symbols. Um, then you compare that to say Gambit. So Gambit is a hero, but you know, when it comes to on the spectrum of like heroicism, um, I think this makes sense. Gambit has half as many heroic actions has almost as many uh, attacks, which this one's a little surprising, he's having less of that, but then is just way more mobile. He's moving around the map much, much faster than Cyclops. And I, to me, that's not the thing I remember most about Gambit, like him being acrobatic, but the same thing could be said for any of like the Spider-Man uh, characters out there. The only problem is I don't have uh, these versions that have the breakdown. This is another like divider that I printed off. Remember last time I showed you uh, these dividers and these boxes are all from Tom Teaches. And honestly, I think I'm gonna go back to using the Tom Teaches ones because they're just so nice. This is cool because it shows me, like you at a glance, what I'm explaining here, which is each deck is different. Like these two heroes, you know, taken in a, a vacuum, they are going to be suited differently depending on which villain you face, which we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but then you also have someone like Professor X, who's pretty, well, not only pretty, uh, you know, even across the board, which means they're gonna be versatile in whatever scenario you come across, but also he's got an extra wild, which is pretty cool. Um, but then I, because I don't have, uh, you know, for Punisher, I just have just, like, this is awesome. Again, double-sided, so it can go whichever way you need the little tab to go, so it's really easy for you to get all the different characters. Um, but these don't have this breakdown on them, which I might find a way to kind of put here because I'm a geek like that. But I looked through Punisher's deck, and if you include things like this, the, the extra abilities up here, which I actually don't know if these do, I need to look through. Um, well, if you don't include him, he has six attack. So that's, 
uh, you know, one more than Cyclops did. But if you include the extra punches that these uh, two extra abilities give him, he has 12 in his deck. So, um, and I didn't count the heroic. Hold on. Yeah, there are two. He has two heroic actions in his whole deck. So one there, and it's just heroic, so that's, and there's that one. So the only time he can be heroic is when he absolutely puts 100% of his focus into it, and the rest of your turn kind of feels like a missed opportunity. So the, the um, uh, asymmetry light uh, of these decks, I think is really cool um, because it gives, and then, you know, Venom can move to any location and Punch there is his special ability um, or symbiote, symbiote enhancement. Uh, so you can move and punch. That's in addition to this down here. And we'll talk about why this is important uh, coming up next. Um, and then you may draw until you have a hand of three in your heart. So there are some that have, that's why I couldn't decide. There are some characters who have two. Uh, special like rule cards and other ones that have three like in his case and some of them like this has three different ones so depending on which special card you draw they are going to be uh you know different abilities as opposed to say uh Groot so he has all of his cards aside from the wild ones um it, it's you'll notice he only has three varieties of cards in his whole deck. It's the move one, it's the punch one, and it's the heroic one. And so I am Groot, move any other hero to a location adjacent to them. Or, yeah. Um, I am Groot with an exclamation, you and another hero deal punches in your respective locations, and we are Groot, you and another hero draw one card. And then each of them has a punch, move, or a heroic star at the bottom. And that's it. That's your entire deck. So, like, a, a complete total uh, support character uh, as opposed to, you know, someone like Professor X who's ready to, to help out in any way they can or the Punisher who's going to do a bunch of damage. So you better hope that there's a bunch of things to do damage to because if you don't have any thugs available and you're not able to attack the hero yet, a character who mainly is there to deal damage is going to be not utilized fully. Um, so the asymmetry light is, it's not, I, I say the light part because it's not like you're playing root. It's not like you're playing a game where you really need to study what makes your deck tick. I mean, you could just flip through a deck and without even having one of these breakdowns, at a glance, you could be like, oh man, this guy's all about dealing damage. Oh, hold on. This one, maybe they all have three and I missed it. Oh my gosh. Okay. With that, he has six, if, I, if you include the damage from the special abilities, he has 16 punches. So yeah, I think they all have three special cards. Um, and it's, it, one of the things I wasn't sure about in the game is if the characters are really gonna feel different. Um, because, you know, the minis are great, but I think we've all seen enough games where there are some table presence that makes up for like what's underneath it, what makes it tick. Uh, and if it was just that they have cute minis, um, I wasn't sure if that was going to sustain it. And when I looked at it being like a, you know, recovering magic player, the fact that most nine of 12 cards in each deck have no text, have just these abilities. I was like, I don't know if that's really going to, you know, work out. I don't know if that's going to, make this game really sing but that's because i didn't fully understand the part that's down here so you'll notice at the bottom the uh, of the card there's this like arrow portion um and the reason this is kind of designed that way is because when you play a card next to somebody else not only do you get the things at the bottom of your card and actually let's use Let's use one of the special, oh my gosh, I'm making a mess. Okay, so you have your card and the person, your uh, teammate has played before you, they just played theirs. So they moved and punched. And now you have a card that lets you move. And then the special part, you may draw until you have three cards in your hand. So um, you get to access the parts down here that are in this arrow. 
So instead of just moving, now you're going to have up to two moves and a punch. And then you'll be able to draw cards until you have three in your hand. So by this simple rule of connecting the arrows at the bottom. Now, if you know the opposite were to happen, if you know Punisher were to be forced to use his, one of his two heroic cards, he would not have access to this drawing cards until his because that's not in the arrow. So if he plays this, it turns this action, the single action, into not quite as much of a blow because he at least gets to move with it too. Now you don't need to use everything. Maybe you don't want to move. Or maybe you want the move, but you don't really have anything to use the star on. Um, you just really need to move for some reason. Then this is a way that you can essentially exp like broaden your range because the Punisher may not have many heroic cards and may have a ton of attacks, but you need to take into account the Punisher is also going to be using other cards from whoever else is with him. So having a character who's really high on attacks is actually, and, and then a character who's really low on attacks is actually a really great strategy because all the attack cards that are gonna be gumming up this deck, you're going to be supplying the rest of your team with those punch actions. Um, so they might not have as many and you might turn all of their actions into you know, these high powered damage dealing things because you have a ton of them. And so when you play a card, you have to take into account not only, you know, what came before, like maybe this would be, you want to draw cards because maybe you took some damage, but the card before you already has a move. So you're like, well, that would be a waste because I only need to move one space. So maybe I'll play that and move a space, I'll do two, two damage instead of one, and I can save a civilian. And then whoever comes after me has these two things that they can use as well. So it makes, in, in a like text-free zone, it just super efficiently turns this game into like table talk central. Because there's not just, oh, I'm playing a card to do a thing. Like, you know, I love Sentinels of the Multiverse, um, and in that game, you also want to talk to be like, I can do damage to the villain. Well, I can take care of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the stage that we're facing on, whatever it is. But, and there are some things that, that intertwine, but for the most part, if you're playing Bunker, the guy who wants to collect a bunch of, you know, parts of his suit of armor, your turn is going to be based on building out your suit and dealing damage with it. In Marvel United, Punisher is not just focused on dealing damage, even though that's the majority of his deck. You're going to, as Punisher, going to be incentivized to talk about, okay, what what would it help? What do you need on your next turn that I can play on mine? And you're trying to find that sweet spot of what's going to make your turn great, but also going to make your uh, teammates' turn great when they come up next. It's just super super fun and because the majority of your deck is text free you don't have to explain like what does that card do again blah, blah, blah. how am i going to use it it's just the four symbols the three the three actions and the wild one and when you can play a card that has a wild one your team is just like yeah it's awesome and you feel like a superhero because you're bringing this thing that other people need so it's yeah the asymmetry light and that goes into that action, like, share. I, I totally accidentally chose, like, the most similar cards here. Um, I did not mean to, to do that. Let's, hold on, let's, let's do something here. There we go, Jubilee. Um, so, uh, it'd be a great example. Like, doesn't have a ton, look at that, doesn't have a ton of attack bunch of heroicism and moving but two attack that'd be a pretty good one to link up with punisher um because you know different heroes are good at different things simple but the game does it well super super well all right next up setting and villains um so i talked about this last time how i used to just shuffle all these together um but each of the expansions that i have comes with its own like set 
of locations. So here are the original Marvel United locations and you're going to shuffle these and take out six if there are more than six and you're going to place them around the table. Um, and at the bottom of each card, there's two things that make them unique, um, aside from the name, Central Park. Um, so at the bottom of this card, there's going to be an enemy, uh, like a villain plot card. It's gonna cover up this ability. And until this plot card is dealt with, you don't get this ability. Um, and the other thing is, at the top, it's gonna show you in like light coloration, what this is going to start with. So this position or this uh, location starts with two civilians, two thugs and an empty space. This one starts with one civilian and two empty spaces. One, two and one. So it, it not only shows you, you know, the asymmetry of how these positions begin the game, but also importantly, the more spaces there are on the board, the more of these little tokens um, this can hold before it overflows. And anytime you need to add a thug or a civilian token to a location, but it's already filled up, that's considered overflow. And depending on which villain you're playing, there usually is something that they get to do at that point. And you don't want to have that happen. So that's asymmetric, the way it starts asymmetric. But the big one down here is usually an end of turn ability. So if you took, took care of the plot card that was here, um, then anytime you end your turn on the shield helicarrier, you may move to any other location. Boom, and this is the example of why I decided maybe I should keep this by set and then instead of just shuffling them together and having this just like wild, eclectic, you know, combination of places uh, that we're supposedly, you know, fighting on, we have like a one, uh, you know, bespoke set of locations because there's typically one of these in every one of these sets that you may move to any other location, um, which is helpful, but it's kind of lame if that's honestly even two of the ones of the six. You're just like, I'd much rather have it be, you know, draw until you have a uh, three cards in your hand or discard one card from your hand to the bottom of your deck to remove one crisis token from anywhere. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of different abilities and that's just the locations, which again, I like games that the more things I get, I get to just put them all together, like my giant stack of heroes or what we're about to talk about here. Um, but these, I'm excited to try this in the other format, um, you know, by set instead of all together. So, Villains, um, as you might expect, are kind of like the the real meat and potatoes of what make each matchup feel different. Because many of them, not all of them, many of them will have special rules or special setup. Um, and then if some of them have the super villain opportunity, you can use that where someone is uh, acts as the villain against the other player. So instead of using just like a deck of cards to determine what they do, someone gets to play them. Um, but then on the front, you see a couple things that are the same, but many things are different. First of all, over here, uh, depending on the number of players, so two, three, or four, is going to be how much health the uh, villain starts with. Um, if you're playing the single player mode where you shuffle three hero cards together, then you would play like you have three because you have three heroes worth of abilities. Um, so that's how many hits they need to take before they can, you know, be knocked out and the game wins. Uh, the game wins. <laughs> the game ends. Um, they also all have a BAM ability, which is a special ability that happens whenever they draw a card with that symbol on it. And we'll get to that in a bit. Um, <clears throat> overflow. It's like we talked about. So many, I'm not going to say all, but I'm going to, I'm going to confidently say almost all, <laughs> uh, but possibly all, have an overflow ability where anytime one could be placed or needs to be placed but can't, something bad happens. You don't want those to happen. And then last but not least, special rules or sometimes uh, villainous plot. Now, normally you can lose the game in one of two ways. One is uh, a player has to draw a card, but they don't have any in their deck or their hand, so they just like run out of energy. Um, or the villain needs to draw a card, 
and they don't have any, so that's running out of time. Villainous plots are a third way, and that's essentially the core of what that villain is trying to do. Um, and the so you're you're um, you know the heroes lose when the group has four KO tokens. So uh, if Ronan's made it knocked out four different heroes or a hero four times, um, then that's apparently what he considers like victory. Red Skull has this fear track, um, and any time the they deal this BAM token comes up, uh, deal one damage to each hero in Red Skull's location and increase the fear track by two. Or Overflow, if you can't place one of these tokens, increase the fear track by one for each token you couldn't add. So if the fear track makes it to 20, boom, game over, doesn't matter where you're at in the game. The hero and the villain decks could have tons of cards, but if you if you allowed the uh, fear track to get up to 20, game over. Um, <clears throat> so obviously those are really fun because just in and of that itself, uh, the villains are going to feel very different. Um, but that's not the only way that they actually are different. So let's take Red Skull, for example. Um, so in each uh, villain kind of area, you have, oh, I said plot cards. These are the plot cards, these are the threat cards. Um, so you have these two different things. One looks like the hero cards, because it's just a big bust of, you know, the hero done in this really awesome style, in my opinion. I know it's not for everybody, but. Um, and these are going to, like the, the kind of crux of the game, I'm burying the lead here, <laughs> because uh, the way that this game works, move this out so you know we're doing our example where jubilee is taking advantage of all the punches and then venom goes and look at that they're all chaining their actions together at this point when it's the hero's turn earlier in the game it's going to be three actions and then the villain goes later on it's just gonna be two actions and then the hero go or the, the villain so you're going to draw and that's going to go in that chain so you're going to have three heroes, one villain, and then each card is gonna show you a couple of things. This shows you how many uh, spaces the villain is going to move in a clockwise manner. So sometimes they don't move at all. Sometimes they move a bunch. And sometimes they have the BAM icon, which remember for this one, is going to do damage to heroes at his location. So he's gonna move four, and then punch a bunch of people. <laughs> and add some fear. And then some of them will have this stuff down here, which said like that uh, target is where he goes. So that's the spot he lands on after moving four spaces. So he's putting two thugs there and one on either of the neighboring ones. So sometimes it's, there's not a bam here, but he's putting a ton of guys down, four icons or four tokens. So aside from a totally empty, biggest space out there this is almost guaranteed to overflow and then two on either side that could overflow too um, but sometimes you have extra rules just like the characters sometimes have cards that aren't just the symbols which the majority of villain cards are this it's like moving maybe a bam and then putting down either civilians or thugs then sometimes there's a rule so Hydra Insurgency, for each crisis token the heroes have, advance the fear track by one. Which, you're saying, what's a crisis token? Then there are other, um, there are other, like, rules that would give them crisis tokens based off of cards the hero, or the, the villain draws. So, that gets placed there, and then gameplay would continue after that. So, even though this is in between here, these are actually still connected. So Punisher still gets to take advantage of Venom's actions over here. This is just a way of showing in the timeline. Like you imagine like a, a comic book panning out in front of you, all the actions taking place. And like I said, later on, that's gonna lead to where heroes are only able to take two actions, then the villain goes, take another two actions, and then the villain goes. So you might notice you're gonna have to wait a lot longer for your turns, and there's going to be two, if you're playing a three-player game, two villain actions that are gonna happen in between each of your turns. So later in the game, that's gonna make a big difference. So the 
the fact that, you know, uh, these are also different, and obviously the villain dashboards are different, but that's not the only thing. So let's set up a map here real quick. Okay, so uh, one thing that I guess I'll point out that I don't have for this game are the like thicker card stock um, or cardboard. Like all my locations are the thin and same thing with the villain things, which is a little bit of a bummer because as you can see, um, there's a decent amount of warping uh, going on, but not anything terrible. And as you can also see, these boxes don't have a lot of extra room. So if I had those things, I don't know if I would really be able to fit it all in two boxes. And that's kind of what I'm most interested in. So I'm not gonna set up all the you know little tokens here. I'm just gonna show you the general map because this is kind of an important concept. So first of all, the villain dashboard. Um, now there are gonna be three different missions here that when you complete one of them, doesn't matter the order, um, you're going to, like if you complete this one over here, you're just gonna shift the other ones over and remove that one, which means this would be unlocked. So now villain acts after every two hero cards. Remember that thing I told you about? It happens right away. So pro tip, if you're playing the game, try to get it so you can finish two missions as close together as possible. Because if you just chase down the first one, all you're doing is making it so the villain is doing things more often. Um, now, as soon as you can get that second mission taken care of, now the villain is vulnerable to damage, but only at this point. So at the beginning, when you find out how many damage tokens or health tokens that the villain's gonna get, you can't do anything about this until you have completed that second mission. He's just wandering around the city with no recourse. Um, you need to do the things first before you can start punching them. And if you get the third one, which doesn't happen every game, each hero immediately draws one card, which is a good way to heal yourself later on because in the game, taking damage just means you discard a card. So the three ways or three missions that you need to complete, rescue civilians. So anytime you do one of those star actions on a civilian, they come off of the space and get placed here. Once you've done that for nine, you've rescued the civilians, mission accomplished. So if that was there, boop, you take it off. Defeat thugs works the same way, except with punches and thugs. And clear threats is what we're gonna talk about now. So these get placed out at the beginning of the game. Um, and then the threat deck has six cards and only six for each villain. Shuffle them up and you're going to place them on the bottom of each of these locations. So now, all of those abilities that these locations give you, usually like end of turn sort of things, they're covered up. Some of them are covered up by uh, essentially like missions. Like each thug at this location requires two damage to be defeated instead of just one. And that's gonna be there until somebody or multiple somebodies over the course of multiple turns spends three heroic actions here. And once you've done that, then this card goes away. You would take it off of the uh, spot. This becomes available and the little skull icon here goes over because you cleared one threat. So you are one down. So to complete this mission, you need to take care of four of these things. The other type are villains, like or like henchmen. So they have a number of hit points. They are always uh, susceptible to damage. Doesn't matter how far you're out on this track, you can always punch these guys. So Crossbones here has six health and you can start beating up on him right away. Anytime the villain draws a BAM card, he would activate. So he's gonna deal two damage to each hero location in this location, um, each hero in this location. Any hero can prevent this uh, by taking two crisis tokens. So remember where you wondered where those crisis tokens came from? Same thing with Bob, agent of Hydra. Only four hit points, and he doesn't activate on BAM. He just says, heroes starting their turn in this location take one crisis token. So he's just like a bad effect that's in play until he's dealt with. Um, so again, not only are, is each villain dashboard different, each villain's deck is different, and each villain has their own set of threat cards that you need to deal with. Depending on where you're facing the villains, the scenario is going to be different as well. So just so much 
like a, a world building for your individual game just based on what you've chosen. So the last thing, the last cool idea I've labeled as uh, sliders for everything. So not only are you choosing just from all these different heroes and villains over here, and you're choosing from all these different location sets, again, based on what you would own. Um, and then in here, I'm not even gonna touch the minis. I've talked about the minis last time, but you also have these challenges that you can add to the game. So in the base game, you have your moderate, hard, and heroic challenge. So removing the single wild, double wild, or both single and double wild from your deck. It's going to make the game completely different. But then for each of the expansions, they have another challenge card specific to that uh, expansion. So Enter the Spider-Verse has something that's all about having your identity exposed. Um, which is not good. You don't want to have that happen. For Guardians of the Galaxy, you have your Plan Bs, which are obviously more difficult to complete. Uh, however, you can just defeat the villain immediately if you complete all three of these Plan B missions. So, you know, it doesn't matter if... Uh, you're nowhere close to dealing all 11 points of damage if you're playing four players against Red Skull. If you can complete these things, which are hefty uh, you know, challenges uh, by themselves, you just beat Red Skull. So you have that. Rise of uh, Black Panther. So you have each hero is going to be linked to a different location. So you're going to put out these location markers and each player is going to take the uh, corresponding one. Anytime overflow is triggered there, the hero who's uh, associated with that location takes a damage. So like you have this vested interest in keeping your location safe. Um, Tales of Asgard, you're going to have these other tokens, um, these sneaky tokens, uh, which are going to allow it, the game to have a traitor challenge um, to figure out there's someone who's actually working to help the villain. Um, so, you know, the traitor thing that other games have. And the last one I've got, uh, Blue Team. Gold Team and Blue Team are the two different boxes. They have the same kind of rule set that comes with them, which essentially, boop, goes over this overlay. And instead of having the normal missions, each team is going to have a reduced number of civilians, threats, and thugs they need to deal with. Um, so roughly half of what you normally need to do. And when you complete it, you get to place your unlock symbol on that thing because you, at the end of the game, when the villain is defeated, you want to be able to say, and you put all the damage you deal to the villains in your area. You want to say that you did the most damage to the villain. Um, but the thing is, if gold team unlocks both of them, they can start beating up on Red Skull. If blue team's lagging behind, they can't be doing damage until they unlock that second one. So again, uh, just another way to change the game up um, in a pretty huge way. And last, but definitely not least, Return of the Sinister Six. Again, talked about this last time. I slept on most of the expansions my first time because I didn't know if I'd really like the game a lot. So what Return of the Sinister Six does is the Sinister Six from the Spider-Man series, um, they act together. So you have kind of a, a separate way of working this out. Um, and instead of having the full deck, the full like super villain deck, you have the Sinister Six deck, which has all of these separately, but then you have some overflow and special rules. And these six guys are gonna be running around the city and you need to deal with them. They all have different health, but you need to make them vulnerable before you can deal damage. So completely like supersedes this whole system over here and it actually goes in the middle of your table with the locations around it. So there are always gonna be six locations, whether you're playing this or the regular game mode. Completely different way of playing the game, um, totally changes things up and is super cool. So yeah, just like an unbelievable amount of variety. And I said sliders for everything. Some heroes are going to be almost custom made to go against certain villains and vice versa. Um, you're gonna be able to 
change the challenge of the game by just removing one or two cards from your deck. Um, and you're going to be able to drastically change the games if you put any of these challenges in. So it's within a pretty simple rule set, there's just so much game to be played. And thanks to these little printouts that they have, you can actually not just keep track of what games you've played, you can have this little, you know, thing that tells you which heroes have you, uh, you know, won a game with, which villains have you defeated, and which, like, challenge level have you beat them on. And they have this for X-Men 1, I just haven't printed it out yet. So, yeah, I mean, man, I guess the last cool idea is just having a bajillion options for the game. Okay. Whew. Another video on Gift Boss Hobby. Another of me talking probably way too long. Um, <laughs> hope you enjoyed uh, me explaining the ideas that I love about Marvel United after kind of gushing about the things about it that I love last time. Um, I believe next time video will be coming out will be a uh, state of the hobby. But after that, uh, there might be some root stuff coming out. Um, but if not, and even if there is after that, there will be more of this, more of, so what's all this about? Insert game that I love here because I am enjoying really putting some time into the collection that we have uh, of games that uh, re like regularly hit the table or haven't hit the table in a while, but deserve to for insert reasons here because, um, you know, what good is collecting things if you don't just every now and then stop to really appreciate how much you love them. So with that, um, thanks for taking a pause with Give Pause Hobby and happy gaming. We'll see you next time.